Good morning, church. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I welcome you all this morning to our worship service. We worship in the Word of God. And I pray that God will truly bless each and every one of you. I'm excited today because we start our new series. And we start our new series. And the title of our new series is Challenges of Changing Times. Challenges of Changing Times. And guess what? We've left the New Testament and we've gone to the Old Testament. So there's been a, a change from the New to the Old but we all know that God's word, whether the New Testament and the Old Testament, is a blessing unto each and every one of us. I want to start off uh, with the word of prayer and ask the Lord to guide us and bless us as we look at his word this morning and then we will proceed. Father, I just want to thank you and give you all the glory, praise and honor. I thank you, Jehovah, for this privilege of bringing your word to your people. Uh, Lord, today's word is about your people. It's for your people. And I pray that each one who's listening uh, to this message would receive a word in season. What do I mean by a word in season? A word that will encourage them, a word that will give them a new direction, new strength, new encouragement, a word that will direct them towards you as, as, as their hope. As, as their God, as their light, that they would look to you for strength and, and, and salvation. And, and that, Lord, they would, they would turn to you, the author and perfecter of their faith. Father, we pray a special blessing upon this new series, Challenges of Changing Times. And as we find ourselves in, challenge, in many challenges of the changing times that are currently existing because of COVID, we really pray for the Spirit to guide each and every one of us, and we really pray, Jehovah, that your name will be highly exalted and lifted high. Amen and amen. You know, church, I've been looking at this new series and looking at last week's word, and last week's word challenged me personally because... Uh, it, it spoke of encouragement and in case you didn't hear last week's word last week's word was on encouragement the important of encouraging one another supporting one another showing one another love and it's been challenging me that uh, am I encouraging people enough and the character that we looked at was Barnabas and how people saw Christ in Barnabas and the challenge is for us to be so encouraging that people would see Christ in us. So I pray that you consider encouragement as well as we start this new series. And in that regard, I want to speak to anybody who needs encouragement or anybody in our church who needs help. If you need help of any kind, you know, it may be you don't have enough food or you may be facing certain challenges of these difficult times, that you would come to the church, you would come to us, the pastors. You would let us know that you need somebody. Perhaps you're just feeling alone. Pick up the phone, phone us, send us a message so that we can reach out to you. And it might even be more severe where you feel you need counseling. We've got people to counsel. We've got professional counsel, counselors that can speak to you if you have any issues. I just want to let you know right now that the leadership of LBC in the love of our Lord Jesus Christ is reaching out to you. It's very difficult with COVID when we're not meeting. Uh, I pray that each one of us would be humble enough uh, to, when needing help, to reach out to the church so that the church can see how it can help you. I've been also humbled, and so has been Byron, by the encouragement we get from you. We are your pastors, we are your leaders, but believe it or not, you've been an encouragement to us. So it's not a one-way thing, but you guys have been such an encouragement to us. And you've really supported us. The elders have really supported me and Byron. And all the other church members have really been supporting me and Byron. And that goes with our, with our deep and sincere gratitude and thanks. May the good Lord bless each and every one of you for doing so. As we start this series, I thought it would be nice if we opened up in communion, I thought it would be nice 
if we opened up in communion. And the scripture that I have for communion this morning comes from the book of John in chapter 6. Uh, I'll read from 52 uh, to 57. Um, it reads as follows. So Jesus said to them, uh, this might be uh, 53, uh, Truly, truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. So I've been thinking about that, that we, we have Christ, we have his flesh, his body, we have his blood, and we eat this to embrace or receive eternal life. And as we do so this morning, as we partake in the bread and the blood, I want you to partake in, in so doing to receive eternal life that is ordained in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This eternal life, however, comes with uh, certain benefits. And one of those benefits is the Holy Spirit, that you may receive a renewing of the Holy Spirit that will empower you to deal with the challenges of the changing times. So not only do we want to receive eternal life this morning as we partake of the body and the blood of Christ, but we want to receive God's strength and God's guidance in the challenges of the changing times. In other words, we invite in Christ and God into this new series. We want to embrace this new series as coming from Christ himself. This is what uh, happened in the Last Supper that Peter and John prepared uh, in, in, in the book of Luke. It says there in verse 17, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, and this is Jesus, take this and, di and divide it among you. So Jesus took the cup. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. So Christ took the cup. And in verse 19, it continues, it says, And he took the bread and gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we do this according to Christ's instructions in remembrance of him. In verse 20, it says, In the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So Christ's blood was poured out for us. Christ's blood was poured out that we may receive a new life. A new life in him and a new life of righteousness. So I want us to pray, bless the bread, and then bless uh, 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 the cup, and then partake in the elements. Lord Jesus, this is the cup of your blood which we bless in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, reminding us, Jehovah, that your blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And Lord, as we raise this cup and partake of this cup, we partake in the forgiveness that is ordained in the blood of Jesus. We partake of the life that we receive because Jesus gave his life for us. He loved us so much that he gave up his life that we may have eternal life through him. So Father, bless the cup of your blood and as we take this cup, we receive the life in your blood. In the same manner, Jehovah, we bless the bread in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the body of Christ which was broken for us. And we remind ourselves, Jehovah, as we bless this bread in your name, that Father, you suffered that we may receive healing, that by your stripes we may be healed. Your body had, been, had to be broken for us. Father, bless the bread, Jehovah, as we partake of it, may we partake in the very life 
life-giving body of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. You may now partake of the bread. Amen. And you can now partake of the blood. Once again, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your body which was broken for us. And we thank you for your blood which was shed that we may receive forgiveness of our sins. But Lord, we partake today asking for eternal life. And we partake today that your spirit may fill us anew. Fill us and give us the wisdom and the strength for the challenges of the changing times. May we be an encouragement to one another as Christ was an encouragement to us and may we bear each other's burdens and be there for one another that it can be seen whose children we are. We are the children of a loving and caring God. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. The title of my message this morning is Exploring Your Landscape. And the first thing that has come out of, 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 of this series, Challenges of Changing Times, is exploring your landscape. And, and, and it's almost like surveying, as surveyors would do. They look at the landscape around them. They look at the landscape around their lives. And before I explain further, I want us to take a... a, 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 a uh, our reading from the big book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and that's in chapter 11, from verse 24 to 31. This is what the writer to the Hebrews uh, uh, wrote in Hebrews chapter 11, 24 to 31. By the way, there are some theologians who believe Barnabas wrote the book of Hebrews. Of course, there is no proof. We don't know who the author of, of Hebrews is, but there are some theologians who believe Barnabas might, might have written the book of Hebrews. It reads as follows, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead and this becomes very important today because he was looking ahead to his reward by faith he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger he persevered because he saw him who is invisible by faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Many characters have been mentioned in this narrative, but it's, it's, it's all about Moses. Moses who led the people of Israel out of Egypt. But it starts with his journey. It starts with Moses surveying and looking at his life. And remember, when you're surveying and looking at your life, you need to look at where you're coming from. You need to look at where you're at. And you need to look at where you're going. A, 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 a good survey or a good, a good, when you explore your life in detail, explore the landscape around you, 
you need to do uh, those two, those three things. And when Moses did those three things, he came up with a few things. One of the things that he came up with, he identified that he was an Israelite, he was a Jew. And therefore, even though he grew up in Pharaoh's household, Moses considered himself a Jew. And therefore, he wanted to be treated as a Jew. He did not consider the benefits of, 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 of being in Pharaoh's household. In other words, the pleasures and the riches that uh, uh, came with being Pharaoh's uh, uh, daughter's son, he did not consider those important, but considered where he was going, where he came from, and where he was going. And it says there, if you heard it correctly in verse 26, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. Even though we are in the old, referring to the Old Testament, listen to this, for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. So you must know where you are going. And you must know which side you are on. Sometimes we don't know which side we are on, but Moses quickly identified with the side of God. He quickly identified himself with the side of the Israelites. But when the story continues, it starts to change. And it says, even from the beginning, by faith, by faith, he kept the Passover. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused. So even his survey and his exploring was all done by faith. And perhaps we need to consider that as we look at our lives and look at where we are and where we're going, that it is important that we do it by faith. And it continues that by faith the walls of Jericho fell. And by faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who are disobedient. So in looking at our landscape and exploring our landscape, it becomes important that we do it by faith. We do it by faith. So that when you face challenges and changes, you will be able to overcome because God, God is fighting for you. God is guiding you. You are on the side of God. And the important thing is Moses chose to be on the side of God. He could have chosen to be on the side of Pharaoh and all the things that came with that, the riches. But we know that Pharaoh had his own gods and his own religion, religious things that they used to practice. So he could have chosen that. But Moses chose the side of God. And so you need to choose the side of God. If you want to have a correct perspective of your life and to properly explore your landscape, you need to do it under the guide of God's word, under the guide of our faith, under the guide of the Holy Spirit. One of the things as we go through the story, you notice uh, is, is that Moses is mentioned, Rehab is mentioned, um, but Joshua is not mentioned. And this has been something that we've been discussing since last week, talking about encouragement, how many things happened, but there were people who were assumed in the story or people who were busy in the background. And Joshua was one of those people who was busy in the background as a servant of Moses. He was busy doing other things. And even in, the, in certain narratives, he was not written about we know that as Moses' assistant and as Moses' servant, Joshua was busy in the background. Just like Barnabas did a lot of things in the background. And we saw Paul coming out and doing these great things. And we saw Mark have eventually writing the Gospel of Mark. But Barnabas was there quietly encouraging them. And one of the people who is assumed and behind this story is a character called Joshua. And Joshua will become important in our series as, as we look at uh, challenges of changing times. The first thing that I want us to have a look at on my first subtitle is Leadership in Transition. 
Moses is old. He has taken the Israelites right to the promised land, almost to the finish line. But God says to him that, Moses, you're not going to cross over. You're not going to cross over. And so in the first thing in any uh, uh, change, in any situation is there may be a leadership in transition or a change in leadership. And I want us to turn to the book of Deuteronomy just to read a bit concerning this Joshua to Moses, or rather this Moses to Joshua succession. Turn to Deuteronomy 31 and I'll be reading from verse 1 to verse 8. Then Moses went out and spoke these words to Israel. I am now a hundred and twenty years old and no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you and you will take possession of their land. Joshua also will cross over ahead of you as the Lord said, and the Lord will do to them what he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites, whom he destroyed along with their land. The Lord will deliver them to you. You must do to them all that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses, it says in verse 7, summon Joshua and say to him in the presence of all Israel, be strong and courageous, for you must go with these people into the land the Lord sowed to your ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And again he says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. I love that word discouraged because we've been speaking about being encouraged. And then here he says, do not be discouraged. So we mustn't be discouraged and we mustn't be filled with fear. So in any change and situation where the things go in a different dynamic, whether you get a new job, whether you go to a new school, you'll be led by different people. And in this case, we see that Moses is not going to be around. And in the promised land, Joshua has to take over. There is this transition and hand over to Joshua. So you must be able to embrace or be willing to adjust to new leadership. I'm speaking as well in terms of LBC. Me and Byron are young pastors who just took this church over just this year. And in this transition period, we've enjoyed your success, we, I mean your encouragement and your support. And it is important that we support one another and embrace ourselves, especially in transition periods where people are quite not sure what the future holds. But this is the thing, by faith, by faith, by faith. Each one of us must stand by faith. Me and Byron stand as your pastors by faith. Yes, sometimes we may feel challenged. Yes, sometimes we may feel overwhelmed. But by faith, by faith, our God is on our side. And all of us must stand by faith uh, in, in what we face. We must stand by faith when new beginnings and new starts come our way. We need to stand in faith because the only thing that is sure and the only thing that is faithful to each generation is our Lord and our God. And in this newness and in these changes, we must stand with the God who is faithful to each generation. By faith, we will stand. And through faith, we will have the strength of God to overcome. I tell you what, Joshua was a man of faith. Joshua was a man of faith. And Moses was handing over to a man of faith. And I would like to believe that myself and Pastor Byron are men of faith. But it, it, it's not only about the leaders, it's about the people as well who embraced Joshua. They embraced Joshua as he was being given this button. We, we've been given this button by Pastor Martin and, 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 and we embraced it. But it's for all of us in unity and love of the Holy Spirit to embrace this newness 
and to stand courageous to face the challenges that are coming ahead of us and trust that our Lord and our God is going to see us through it because he is faithful and he will indeed see us through it. Moses had been in the wilderness 40 years. Probably, I think the scripture says he was going to 120 and he knew that he was not going to enter the promised land. He was not going to enter the promised land. But one thing he knew, it was critical for him to hand over to somebody else to continue the work of God. And so we want to encourage, we want to be encouraged by that, that the work of God will continue. Under my leadership and Pastor Byron, the work of God will continue. And so it was handed over uh, to Joshua and Joshua was encouraged. Please continue to pray for us. Continue to encourage us as your pastors. Continue to plead the strength of God upon us and our families and the elders of this church and all the other leaders at LBC. May you continue to pray for us that we may lead you in a mighty way under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So there was a leadership in transition into the promised land, into a new era, into a new beginning. And right now, the same thing could be said about LBC. The second thing, or my second point for today is finishing strong. Before I even look at, at the scriptures, I was an athlete and, and finishing strong was so critical in, in athletics because you could run the race, but if you couldn't finish strong, then your competitors might pass you by. You might not make it to the line. You might not finish that race. And so it was very important. And after losing a couple of races, I realized that I was not finishing strong and I needed to finish strong. So I worked on finishing strong. I worked on reaching that line, the finish line. I worked not only on finishing the finish line as an athlete, I worked on reaching there first before anybody else so that I could win the prize. It's not quite the same in the kingdom of God because all of us will be allowed entry to the kingdom of God. So we just need to believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. Not one singular person will have that prize of entering the kingdom of God. What am I saying? I'm saying in our life, we want to run a race to enter the kingdom of God. We want to run a race to enter the kingdom of God, but do so finishing strong. Because if you tire out and you don't finish the race, then you, 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 you haven't finished. You haven't attained the standard necessary for you to have accomplished that which was required. A person who doesn't finish a race doesn't get a, a, a tag or a number. They, 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 they just fall, fall off the list. And we need to know that if we don't finish strong and we don't finish the race that has been given to us through the gospel of Jesus, then our names will just fall by the wayside. And this becomes a very challenging thing for us Christians when you see how many great people of God are no longer Christians. How many great people who've even written books, people who've preached and done mission work and done all sorts of things for the kingdom of God. And today that same person is no longer a Christian. So did that person finish their race? No. So it is important for, for us to finish our race but to finish our race strong. So Moses had faltered and could not enter the promised land, which was a bit unfair. We can say perhaps he didn't finish his race quite as strong as he was supposed to be. But when he looked at these people, he saw people whose faith was wavering, whose faith was wavering. And one of the requirements for us to finish the race strongly is that our faith must be strong. Our faith must be rooted in our God, in our Lord. We mustn't have this wavering faith, but we must stand strong. And the only two people when the spies were set out who came with a good report 
was Joshua and Caleb. There were 12 sent out and only two of the 12 came up with positive and encouraging reports. The other 10 were saying, it cannot be done. It cannot be done. We cannot possess the promised land. And if they could not possess the promised land, it means they could not finish that which they started when they left Egypt. And that was very sad. But Joseph and Caleb came up with reports that we trust our God. He would not take us to this point to forsake us. We will possess the promised land. And I want to say to somebody out there who's not trusting God for somebody, for something, to, to think about Caleb and to think about Jacob. They did not look at the size of the people possessing that land. They did not look at the challenges that were ahead of him. Instead, they looked at their God and what their God was able to do. And because they looked at their God and their God was so big in comparison to the challenges that they were facing, they were able to come back with positive reports. And hence of the 12, Jacob and Caleb, Joshua, sorry, and Caleb were the only two to enter the promised land. The other 10 did not get that privilege of entering the promised land. I say to you, if you want to finish strong, have the attitude and the faith of Jacob and Caleb. If you want to finish your race and see the kingdom of God and do what God has ordained you to do, I say, have that faith of Jacob and Caleb, regardless of what you're facing, regardless of your challenges, you just look to God, the author and perfecter of our faith, and trust him that he will make a way when there is no way. Perhaps I can take this opportunity to go back to the scriptures in, 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 in Hebrews. I read there from the book of Hebrews, and it says, By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were not doing it by faith. They were drowned. So because the Egyptians did not have the faith and the belief in God, they were drowned. So whatever you're going through, you will make it by faith in God. You will make it by faith in God. And, and they, what the writer to the Hebrews is saying, if you don't have the faith, then you don't have the power that comes from God. You don't have the anointing and the courage that comes from the Holy Spirit. You don't have the word of God to strengthen you. You don't have God at your disposal. And I want you to think about that. God was at the disposal of the Israelites because of their faith. And he parted the Red Sea that they may pass through. But for the Egyptians, sadly enough, because they were not doing it by faith, the scripture says there, they drowned. The Egyptians drowned. I want us to take us to a scripture in the New Testament. And that's 2 Timothy 4, 6 verse 8. It reads as follows. This is Paul talking about his race. And perhaps you can consider his words for your race. For I am ready being poured out like a drink offering. So he's done everything he can. And the time for my departure is near. The end for Paul is near. As the end had come for Moses, the end for Paul is near. I have fought the good fight. Fight the good fight. I have finished the race. Run through. Believe with unwavering faith till the very end. I have kept the faith. Keep the faith. This faith, this gospel that we profess of our Lord Jesus Christ, now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all, I hope you picked up that word, all who have longed for his appearing. What a blessing there is in that scripture. Run your race like Paul, run your race because there is a reward for you. Run your race because you long for God's appearing to us. What an encouragement. Finish the race and run it strong. Finish the race strong. See it through. 
a see through, fight the good fight, and finish the race, that our Lord, our God may receive all the glory. The third thing that I want to talk about, the final thing today, you can't stay where you are in the challenges and the changing uh, times that we find ourselves in. Whenever the one person say the one thing which is sure is that they will be changed. And change means you cannot stay where you are. If you stay where you are, it means there can be no change. So you can't stay where you are. You must move on. In fact, this theme of moving on is, is rooted throughout the Bible. The children of Israel traveled from Egypt to the promised land Canaan. And we too, as we are on this earth, we are only travelers because our final destination is heaven. And so the Lord has set a promised land before you. And how do we get there? What we've been talking about in the past weeks when we were at Pentecost was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been promised and given to each and every one of us. It is that Holy Spirit that will empower you to change and move on. It's that Holy Spirit that will draw you heavenward. It's that Holy Spirit that will teach you the ways of God. It's that Holy Spirit that will shine a light unto your life and unto your path, guiding you in God's ways through his word. It's that Holy Spirit that was promised that is going to be taking you in the right direction. So the first thing that is important for us not to stay where we are or to stay in Egypt or to stay stuck in the mud, as some would say, is for us to, praise, to have the Holy Spirit which will guide us in our spiritual journey. The second point is not only the Holy Spirit, is that the Holy Spirit brings us into a body of Christ. It was promised to all believers, but we see the church in Antioch receiving the Spirit in power. Together, as a church and a body of Christ, we receive the Spirit in power. We receive the Spirit in power so that we can become over, or um, uh, we can defeat the enemy. We can, we, we can, uh, uh, we can receive victory. We receive the Spirit of power, and the word "the power" is dunamis. Dynamite. We receive the spirit of power and dynamite that we may be able to be victorious against the enemy. And one that I'm reminded of Paul who said, do you know that your temple, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Not only that, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is residing in each and every one of us. The power that raised Christ from the dead is residing in you and residing in me. And that power brings us in communion with our brothers in fellowship as, as the, the Holy Church, the Church of God. It brings us together to move ahead the purposes of our God, the purposes of righteousness, to move us towards heaven together in support and encouragement of one another so that none can be left behind. So it is important for us to, to acknowledge the Holy Church. And thirdly, it's to acknowledge where we are going. The Holy Church as we see, or the Holy City in Revelation 21. And I just want to read a bit in Revelation 21. It says, there, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the Holy City, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself.